Welcome to the Women Living Well After 50 podcast. I'm Sulon Carrick and I'm passionate about inspiring, motivating, supporting and informing women over 50 to embrace this exciting time of life. Health and wellness in mind, body and spirit are the foundations for living well, but there is so much more to a life well lived. Each week through conversations with my guests, I'll be presenting topics that will help us all to live well and enjoy life. So join me as we discover new ways to become women living well after 50. Are you ready to start living? What are you waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of the Women Living Well After 50 podcast. I'm Sue Long Carrick and it's lovely to have you join me. Now we hear that it takes a village to raise a child, but today I'm going to be talking to a guest who suggests that we need to build a village later in life. We're going to be talking about how to find community and joy later in life and uh, how we can build our community. One in five Americans always feel lonely or socially isolated. That's what study have shown and the adverse effects of loneliness reportedly become more debilitating the older we get. According to caregiver resources there has been an upward trend in elderly isolation in the past five years. The ramifications include cognitive decline, depression and immune deficiency. My guest today is Florence Ann Romano personal growth strategist and author of Build Your Village, A Guide to Finding Joy and Community in Every Stage of Life. She's going to provide strategies for building healthy, supportive villages later in life. So let's go and join the conversation. Well, I'm delighted to have Florence and Romano join me today. And we're going to be talking about finding finding our community and joy in later life. And I'm a little bit excited about talking about that. So welcome, Florence Ann. Oh, Sue, thank you so much for having me. It's always wonderful to meet a new member of the village. <laughs> now we're, we're connected. <laughs> That's right. And I hadn't actually thought of it that way, but I've done well over 100 podcasts. So I've certainly got a, a, a huge village if I want to avail myself of that. Um, but we're going to be talking about things. Now, in my introduction, I said that we usually talk about it takes a village to raise a child. Right. But we're going to be talking about the other end of life where we're discovering our own village right. um, as we get older and our own community. Right. So what I wanted to start by asking you, what is the importance of having a village and especially in later life? Well, it's funny, you know, you mentioned that that proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And it's a great proverb. It, it absolutely is accurate. But I felt that, especially in, in writing my book, Build a Village, that it it left a lot of people out. It left a lot of people out who don't have children, who have designed their life that way, or maybe they can't have children, whatever the case may be, their life does not include children. And I never wanted people to feel like they did not deserve to find their people or their community if they didn't have kids, that somehow it made them, uh, it didn't make them as important. It didn't make community as important. And so as we get older, though, we we see this interesting change happen in our lives where it's no longer a quantity uh, with people that we have around us. It really becomes a quality. But the older that we get, um, especially, you know, the generation, you know, our, our grandparents' generation, who whatever, however old your grandparents are, you know, around them, their life is changing very drastically as they lose people in their life, whether they move away or they pass on, whatever it might be. It's not as easy to connect. It's not as easy to make friends like it was when we were younger, when you are in school and you know, you're know you meeting people constantly. So as we get older, it can get lonelier. Um, and, and asking for connection or asking for help making those connections, that also can be very challenging for people. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, we find that as we do get older, our self-esteem and our self-confidence drops a little bit. So it, we're not quite as open about putting ourselves out there to meet new people. A lot of people 
feel you know it's it's overwhelming and um especially Especially, you know, if you lose your spouse or your partner or you leave your career, when you're in a career, you've, you're defined in a certain way and you've got your, um, your village around you there. And right. then suddenly you retire and you think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not seeing these people as much. Right. And loneliness is so, in, you know, it is such an important issue that we need to address. So what happens, like, how do you redefine your village if you've left a career or, for example, with me, we've just moved recently back to, um, we've, back to our original home city, but we've lost connection connections with people that we knew so we've got to start again building that village we've got our family and I've got a couple of friends but that's about it so how do you go about redefining your village when you have that loss I always say that philanthropy is a great way to uh, to kind of start moving the needle for yourself because you're right when you're moving back to a hometown or moving somewhere for the first time and you're not familiar with that place, it's difficult to just kind of jump right in and know like where to go and how to meet people. A friend of mine moved to Texas recently and knew not a soul. And she ended up, you know, going to the playground one day with her kids. And I said, okay, you know, you put yourself out there, you know, go walk up to one of the other moms that you see and start having a conversation. And, and she did. And she started meeting people that way and making play dates and doing things like that. And that was the first step for her. Um, but even for me, I grew up in a, in a town, uh, I, I, I had moved to the city for 13 years, then moved back to my hometown. And so many of my friends were all married and had children. And I had not entered that club yet. You know, I had married and children. That wasn't something I, I had, but I had some friends I had grown up with that lived out here. And I reached back out and said, listen, I kind of need you to help reintroduce me to people. I'm really not, you know, I haven't been a part of this community in so long. Uh, and so I understand how you feel about kind of where you are in your life right now. Um, but going back to the idea of philanthropy, I always feel that if you can join something, a community or an organization where it makes your heart beat in some sort of way, it makes your heart flutter in some sort of way, you're going to meet people in that environment that have similar values to you. And so you'll mm -hmm. be able to do something that satiates your heart and your mind perhaps, but then also introduces you to a new group of people that you'll be able to connect with based on common ground. And that's a good way for also not just, you know, maybe people over 50 or retired or, you know, uh, you know, reaching a point in their life where they're not as active anymore. Um, that can also be applied to even teenagers who are feeling like mm. they're left out or isolated. And they find people that have something in common with them. So they feel like that they're not um, on the fringe or in the peripheral for, you um, uh, reasons that they can't understand perhaps. So philanthropy, I think is a way that it can definitely live in a lot of different buckets, a lot of different capacities. Mm. And actually, as we're talking, I mean, I was suggesting that we talked about the village for children and then for older people, but actually all throughout our life, we need our village, don't do. we? Yeah. So um, it's just that perhaps we move to a different village right. throughout our life. Right. Um, so, You've um, talk about six types of villages that we need right. for a, a villagers, that's people, right. that we need for a functioning village. So I, I just wondered if we could talk about that for a moment. Yes. So I wanted to create six archetypes because, you know, Sue, so we've all been there. We've read those books, those personal growth books, and you're like, I'm not going to do any of this. This is all way too hard. This is a heavy lift. I don't have time to deal with this. I need something that I can actually feel like is doable. And so when I was thinking about this idea of loneliness um, and, you know, how do we define that loneliness in a way um, because I'm a visual learner, like, you know, in a way that you can actually, you know, cast it in your mind, how you need to find that support. How do you do that? 
And I figured if you could relate to something, if you could see to something and think, okay, I can see myself in this person. I could see myself in this explanation, or I could see how my best friends or my friends or my family fit into these definitions. It will help me figure out how to build that ecosystem. So the six villagers or the archetypes that I have are accepting, dependable, communicator, cheerleader, organizer and healer. And, you know, I, I, people listening out there don't feel like, oh, God, I got to go write those down right away. And, you know, the, the point is, as I list them, oftentimes people, as I say those, they, those villager names, you already are casting people in them. You're already starting to think automatically, oh, that's probably my best friend, or that's my mom, or, you know, that's my childhood friend. They fit into that category without me giving you a definition to it, because that's the whole point, is this is supposed to be an easy lift for you trying to figure out how the people currently in your life fit into these roles, how you cast them into these roles. Once you do that evaluation, you can start figuring out where the holes are, but you also are going to discover that you might have the wrong people in the wrong seats. You might have to be shifting those people around because perhaps that's why you're feeling like you're a little bit more lonely or disappointed or feel like people are failing you is maybe because you're putting people in seats that they shouldn't be sitting in. We can't expect people to be what we need them to be. We need to meet them where they are, not where we want them to be. So this work that we're doing regarding these villagers has to do with, yes, who do I need in my village, but also how am I showing up for other people? Mm -hmm. And how am I learning about myself through this too? Because it really is a circle. It is reciprocal. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very important because we can't change people. And often we feel that, um, you know, we, we're in perhaps a toxic friendship that we don't want to let it go right. or a toxic right. relationship because we're too scared to let it go. We've relied on it for, for years or we don't know how to, we just don't, right have the courage to get rid of those people right. that right. that's taking it a bit further to what you were talking about because i think we have to also make sure that we've got the right people in our village and if they don't fit in any of those seats um then we need to have the courage to let them go go but so you 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 talk about something that's very interesting and it's actually something i discussed in the book as well is when the village burns down when the village is lost and the village can burn down for a lot of different reasons, whether it's divorce or death or the end of a friendship, a breakup, whatever it might be. Um, but toxic relationships, again, not just romantic relationships, they could be platonic, they could be friendships too. Their relationships end for lots of different reasons. The toxic relationships are difficult ones, uh, certainly in the rebuilding, I would say. Um, it, it gets to a certain point where enough is enough or there is a breaking point. There's a straw that breaks the camel's back. Eventually, somehow that's going to end. Um, but we also need to find the courage within ourselves sometimes to end that. Uh, mm -hmm. And oftentimes we don't want to because attached to that person our people attached to that person is a village maybe that you rely on or a community that you're a part of or socially you're a part of whatever it might be and i say this um from examples from my own life but um even my dad my parents were married for 40 years sue and they got divorced um mm -hmm. and after 40 years i mean that's a long time together they've been divorced about mm -hmm. three years now and my dad recently had a conversation with me saying I really lost most of my friendships after that divorce because I didn't realize that your mom was the one that was attached to all of them. And that's a very common thing, I think, in divorce where the wife hey. really is responsible for the social relationships. Um, but it left my dad feeling like, gosh, I have to do a lot of work on my village because I didn't realize that was going to crumble a bit after it. Not that, they, that people necessarily took sides. It just was the natural evolution of it. Yes. 
that's yeah that happened to us we're both my husband and I've both been married before and the same thing happened there and uh, that is just part of it I think you, you know it's not the same and especially if your parents who were married 40 years they built up friendships together their village together for 40 years when that when they separated that, that changed people it, it didn't feel the same so people naturally either gravitate to one right um, one person of the couple or they go away from both you know right. because they right. can't they're not sure how to react to um both parties so right. it that is a difficult um situation and for someone like your dad it would be very overwhelming because he would feel that he'd have to start all over again in right. building up his village and his right. relationships and later in life that's not quite as easy as we've said right it's not and he if he was sitting here right now he would say the same thing too i mean even um even losing you know the the family her family my mom's family you know yeah. be, you know a family you know they had been together for so long you know it's and, you know we had a new baby cousin that was born in december and uh, he saw her for the first time at my book signing that was just a few weeks ago and he said it's so weird to me to like have not seen this baby yet or to not have seen your mom's family for all this time. And thankfully my parents get along very well and they can be places together and it's okay. Um, but it definitely opened my eyes uh, about the different uh, consequences mm -hmm. of, or the waterfall effect of, uh, uh, of transitions, of life transitions. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it in my own life. I see it in my parents' lives, all of that. Um, but when you get older, and this is where I think my, my dad would agree, he doesn't have the same motivation or enthusiasm to make mm -hmm. those connections as he would when he was younger and in business and all of that. So it takes quite a bit of effort and it's, it makes sense to me why my, like my dad and so many other people, they just get caught in that rut of, it's just easier to stay home and watch Netflix. Mm -hmm and not mm. socialized because I don't want to put the effort in. I just don't have the energy anymore. Mm. And I think, and I'm just speaking generally here, but I do think that men are more like that than perhaps women are. Yes. Um, not saying not saying that women aren't like that, you know, or vice versa, but generally speaking, I know my husband's the same. He had these lifelong friends and then um, the divorce came through and then, they sort of didn't keep in touch and one has passed away now and so for him he's he's often said to me i'm not really interested in having to try and make new friendships yeah. or because it's just all too hard right. and he's in his 70s now so i can understand how your dad's feeling because you know we've sort of been through that in our house as well right. and um you know it it's a shame because uh you're dealing with a traumatic time in your life and that's when you do need your village around right. you. That's true. It's true. And men don't uh, gravitate toward relationships the same way women do. Sisterhood and brotherhood are a little bit different. You know, men don't, um, men have a harder time. I, I think they count on their spouses or their partners to make those relationships for them, you know, um, but, you know, speaking of just making those relationships in general, the one common denominator is the effort, though, uh, that, you know, behind it. And, you know, one thing that I always talk about regarding this work is it sometimes doesn't feel good, you know, so this 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 work of uh, connection. Uh, it takes honesty. It takes vulnerability. It takes you being a little bit brave. What's that saying? Um, you know, in order to get a result you've never had before, you have to do something you've never done before. And so if you are at a point in your life where you are feeling this disconnect, uh, you know, the only thing that is going to change is well, let me say it this way. If, if you're looking to change the situation, you have to be the solution to it. You know, there's this idea that, you know, people say it takes a village, it takes a village and everyone wants to know what's the phone number to call? What's the roadmap to it? You know, are the directions to this village? And yes, I wrote a book about that, hopefully giving directions to that village. 
But just because I tell you that these are the tools you could use that are available to you, it doesn't mean you're going to do it. You have to want it. And mm. that is the biggest difference here right now, I would say, uh, when, when I'm talking to people who are struggling with this, because it's, it, you know, there's a friendship recession going on in our country. There's a mental health, you know, crisis going on in our country. There's a feeling of isolation and loneliness and depression uh, bigger than it ever has been. Uh, it, but the way people solve that, of course, may be different from finding friends or going to therapy or counseling or seeking outside help, whatever it may be. The, the common denominator, again, though, is you deciding that you've had mm -hmm. enough and you are going to make a change. I can't make you do it. No one can. No. And that's with lots of things in life, isn't it? It really does come down to us and how much we want something. So um, I wanted to ask you, uh, with with the pandemic, of course, we were in Australia, we were in lockdown, I think more than any other country. Yes, um, and yeah. uh, it, it, especially one of our states down south was I think well over six months in lockdown and people were just going stir crazy. And of course, from that, there have been a lot of mental health issues uh, right. arise. But I wanted to say that for me, I think that there's a place for online relationships as well as in real life or face to face, because um, with blogging and podcasting and so forth, I've actually made in some wonderful deep friendships with uh, three other women and we actually work out together online we um, we get together one lives in Vancouver and the other two live in different parts of Australia to me uh, and you know we we started a book club online and we meet monthly and we you know so they, I would say, are part of my village because if I need to talk about something, you know, it, we can just hop online. So just because you might not uh, want to go out, there's the right. online world that you can, um, and that just came, you know, we've got, we're all bloggers and right. we, we all love to read. And so, you you know, you start, and what we did was started with a group of six of us during the pandemic just to help each other through and we would meet every month and have a chat and what have we been doing and that sort of thing and through that developed a deeper friendship and uh, so you know you don't necessarily have to have face to like in real life you, you don't know, um, you don't, yeah. and you don't want to devalue uh, what you're experiencing with those girlfriends. Uh, I as well uh, have friends that live in all different parts of you know the globe, and as much as you wish, yes, you could be in person together. It doesn't change the fact that there there is substance there. That's a real friendship. It's based on it's it's based and yeah. built on real stuff. Um, and I think we learned during the pandemic that. We have to be willing uh, to participate in the virtual world uh, if mm. we want to uh, to want to connect or we want to change something about how we're feeling or if we are feeling lonely. Um, and that's a nice first step for people, by the way, who maybe aren't as um, willing to do the in-person thing. You know, maybe that's mm. a little too hard for them right now. But maybe you know, joining some sort of virtual book club or something online that could connect you with people where you could still feel like you have the computer or you have the technology as a little bit of a barrier because you're not ready yes. yet for that. That's okay. That's a step. Um, there is no right or wrong way necessarily to build connection. And I mean, if we really would want to get down and dirty with it, we could say, yes, there's there are inappropriate ways or unhealthy ways or things like that. But right now, if we're just talking at a high level, um, mm -hmm. do what works for you in order to take that first step. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, you talk about also primary and secondary. Yes. Village. So what are they and, and how do they overlap with each other? So, you know, it's funny, you were talking about, you, you know, these virtual friendships that you have. And I was thinking just that I was like, I wonder if I would put them in the primary or secondary. And the truth is I'd put it in primary and I'll explain why your primary village are really your ride or die people. These are the people that are probably your best friends or your family, things like that. 
Um, but they're the ones you probably have the closest or deepest relationship with. Um, but you would think that that would maybe then equate to you being with those people in person, but not necessarily. These women probably know you very, very well and you them, um, and you count on them for quite a bit. The same way you may count on your best friends or family who are in close proximity to you that you see often. So I think that this virtual village you have of these women, they do fall into your primary, but also your secondary, and that they're not physically in your, in your proximity. Um, and and they're not necessarily part of your daily life. Maybe they're there on a weekly basis or what it needs or an as needed basis, but they could probably straddle both. Another example of this would be, okay, yes, you have your friends and family in your primary, but in your secondary village, I always use this example and people laugh, but it's so true. Uh, baristas, the person that you see every morning who goes and gives you your cup of coffee, you probably know that person better than you know a lot of other people in your life. They probably know more about you and you count on them in a way you don't count on a lot of other people in your life. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're giving you that caffeine fix. They're part of your secondary village. They're someone that you interact with very often and they are providing something for you that is important to you that you count on whatever it might be so if you think of it that way and not just in terms of like who are my best friends in my family think about the people you interact with on a daily mm. basis or a weekly basis or in a bi-weekly way or whatever it might be it could even be um you sit on a board of a company or a nonprofit, and once a month you are in a board meeting with those people or you see them in person at a board meeting but you always look forward to seeing some of those people and you have, you know, connections or you network together or, you know, you can count on that person if you know, oh, I need to make a phone call and that person would be a good person to bounce an idea out, off of. Mm -hmm. That person could mm -hmm. be in your mm -hmm. secondary village and be very valuable. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking about your hairstylist. Yeah. You know, we go oh, to gosh. their hairstylist and, and that, you know, they always suggest that they're psychologists um, they as are. well because yeah. they talk to us about everything. So that's uh, definitely that's a, a good one. Oh, Sue, so when they closed all the salons and everything like that here in the States and we couldn't go, I, it, that was more of a primary situation for me. I was like, I need her. I need my hairstylist. She is in my primary village. I, you know, we used to say the essential workers here in the States. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I was like, she's essential. I think we need to open it back up. I think we need her. So you're right. A hairstylist or a barista or something like that, that absolutely falls into your secondary, you know, your secondary village. And also remember your secondary villages can be temporary. Think about when someone in your community passes away, uh, you know, a husband or a wife or someone's mother or father passes away. Um, and you have your family, you have your friends and family in the area that put together a meal train, what we do in the States, you know, we put together a meal train where yeah. uh, for two weeks, they have their meals delivered to their house, all of that. Um, that's a, that's a secondary village and it's temporary. It's during a time of crisis perhaps, but those people at that time are going to be playing a very significant role. Mm, mm. Look, you're raising some excellent points here because I'm, um, you know, uh, when you talk about a village, you just always think about you know, family perhaps, and then your one or two close friends, but you've just opened up a whole, even with the primary and secondary village and things like that in the temporary village. I mean, it's all so important, isn't it? And it's just a matter of reflecting on it all and taking time to think about it, isn't it? Yeah. And just understanding where you are in your life too. Yes. Uh, yes. You, know, you can't expect that you are going to be able to fulfill all those roles at the same time. Someone asked me the other day, who of these six villagers are you? And I said, I'm all of them. And I don't say that in a cocky way. I, I'm all of them to, and I'm, I'm all of them in some respect in a high level way, because to different people, I am, I am somebody I'm their accepting, or I'm their dependable, whatever it might be. And I also know that there are times in my life where I won't be able to play a certain role very well because my life doesn't have the capacity for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was going through, I, I talk about in the book, I froze my eggs when I was 35 years old and um, I went through IVF and did all of this stuff. And I used to be a pretty good organizer villager. I could do put together a lot of, you know, parties and, you know, dates to see people and have fun and socialize. 
And during that time, I could do nothing but concentrate on my own health and myself. And I was a terrible organizer villager. I wasn't social at all. So I knew for a while I had to put the organizer away. And I knew I couldn't be that person to people and they couldn't count on me for it. I've, I've, you know, eventually after coming out of it, I did go back to doing more of it. But my point is understand also what your limitations are in your life and what you're capable of. And, and, and don't expect that you need to be everything to everyone. Your oxygen mask needs to go on you first. Mm, yeah, that's so important, isn't it? Because it's so easy to feel guilty about saying no or not being there. But I think um, being able to uh, identify uh, what type of villager you are as well. And I agree that when you were talking about the different ones, I thought, oh, I could probably fit in into most of those categories but as you say it depends on the situation it depends right. on the you know where who you're with and what you're doing who needs you or what right. you need so exactly. um so that's um i suppose we're talking about how we foster our you know village equalities within ourselves because we must remember that whilst we talk about having that village we have to be there for them as right. well as vice versa we can't be someone living in a village and not sort of right. um what's the word carrying our weight i right. suppose right. um so you know how do we foster that villager quality well i always say know thyself is the number thing in life number one thing in life you have to know who you are what you're capable of you know what your talents are you know what what are your strong suits you know how can you show up for other people? My favorite uh, um, uh, quote is Maya Angelou. People forget what you said, forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of the villagers is when you show up for people, you're usually making them feel a certain way. You're making them see, feel seen, heard, understood, supported, loved, uh, you know, uh, hell, you know, helped or whatever you want to say. It, it, you know, you are usually... Uh, showing up to provide something for them. And uh, I don't know what the meaning of life is. I know what my meaning of life is. My philosophy is to live a life in service of others. Um, but I, I feel like how we show up for one another, how we take care of one another is very important. And as you start to do this exploration of who do I need in my village, but also who am I to other people, the who am I to other people leads us to learn more about ourselves in a way that is also going to help us be able to ask and identify how we need to ask people for help in our lives as well. That is very difficult for people to do, asking for help, because people are always worried that they're going to have to repay a debt in some way if they ask someone mm. for help or there's shame attached to it, thinking I can't do everything myself. I don't want to have to count on someone. Um, so there's, it's very layered. There's a lot of emotional and mental work that goes into this. Um, but in showing up for other people, it, it, it does teach you uh, what is important in life, I would say. And it does teach us that we are responsible for, of course, our own our own development, our own evolution, our own journey, our self-love, our self-care, all of that. But we're also responsible of taking care of one another too. And the mm -hmm. way that I love and the way that you love and anyone else loves, the way that we show love as a verb, love in action is going to be different. But that's what needs to be celebrated is knowing that you can have different people in your life for different reasons, and you are going to be in different people's lives for different reasons. Just because you are someone's accepting villager does not mean you're going to be another person's. It depends on the chemistry. It depends on the relationship. It depends on mm -hmm. why that relationship exists in the first place. Um, just like a romantic relationship, there has to be a reason you want to be in it. That there's a reason you're attracted to each other. There's a reason why you want to be with one and be with one another. Uh, the same goes for friendships. So um, it's it's a lot of work on ourselves and self exploration, um, and also realizing that the way we show up for ourselves and we show up for other people, it's not necessarily an enormous gesture. It's usually very small things that lead to very big res big results. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's an excellent point. Now I'm going to be putting all your, we're coming 
coming to the end of our um, chat and I could chat to you all day. You've got <laughs> lots of information. <laughs> and uh, I do have one question, which I'll leave till the end. But firstly, I will be putting um, all your links into the show notes and encouraging everyone to buy your book, Build Your Village, A Guide to Finding Joy and Community in Every every stage of life because I think that perhaps that should be the first step if we are going to try and define our village and find our village. So um, that will all be in there and hopefully the readers um, will uh, be able to, you know, find some answers there. And I just wanted to ask what prompted you to write the book? During COVID, honestly, Sue, I looked around and I realized that on a global level, we all knew what it felt like to lose our support systems. And, and it's very rare that in a global way, we all know what something feels like. And when I started to dig deeper into what losing our support systems was, uh, I was seeing a lot of moms and parents talking about the village and they lost their nannies, they lost their childcare, they lost, you know, their, their, their grandparents being able to come over and help them. And then it started me thinking a little bit more about, okay, but what about the people that don't have kids? And mm. what about the people that were even far lonelier, you know, perhaps than a house full of children. Um, and what about those, you know, elderly people who were in homes that could not have any visitors? You know, what about mm -hmm. people who were suffering from mental health issues to begin with, and then were even far more isolated? Um, and it just opened up a Pandora's box of what is happening in our world if we don't have people. You know, I grew up in a, an old fashioned Italian family, multi-generational home. I was surrounded by people constantly. And as I got older, I realized that not everybody was born into that. And mm -hmm. I wanted people to feel empowered that no matter what you were born into in your life, you deserve to find your people. You deserve to find your community and you can create that for yourself. Mm, mm. We've just returned from visiting Papua New Guinea and we went to several vi villages there. And of course, you know, they have a different lifestyle to uh, Western culture. And it was lovely to see that that village atmosphere where they do rely on each other to exist. And, um, you know, they, they're in their own little area. One group had walked three hours to come down to another village to perform you know, for the tourists, um, but it is very much um, vital for them to have their village and everyone having a, being a cog in the wheel in the right. village and with the children and the elderly. And so, yes, it's that culture as well, like the Italian, I'm married to an Italian, so I know what it's like, um, where you have that, you know, you look after all generations right. rather than, um, and you live in that multi-generation home and that's how it is in the villages up in PNG and uh, you know the way the world is at the moment we need that we need that sort of um, surrounding us to be able to uh, cope with what happens in the world at the moment well we're not supposed to do it alone that's the truth no. you know that you yeah. know that the, the, the village concept um, you know there was something special and something that was so very right about that. You know, the reason why that worked so well was because it connection is important. And so I think mm -hmm. as time has gone on and the world has changed, we've 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 started to become more detached from this nucleus, from this nuclear family. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's okay. That that's okay as long as we understand that. It, again, like I said, if you're not born into it, if it's not a part of your culture necessarily, but it's something that is interesting to you, it's something that you know would fulfill you, then you have the power to go out and try to find that for yourself and build that mm -hmm. for yourself. You can choose mm -hmm. those family members then for yourself if you weren't born into it, or if you were born into a situation that was toxic or unhealthy and you remove yourself from it and go off and find uh, a way of finding new connections and new friends and family, um, whatever you need to do in order to find that balance, that peace, that love, uh, I encourage you to do it. Uh, but the one thing I think we can all agree with is 
we're just, we're not meant to do life alone. And it's a lot more fun if you're not doing it alone too. Exactly. What's that um, quote? No man is an island. So right, uh, right. yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, look, it's been lovely chatting to you today, Florence Ann. And uh, before we go, I have a question that I ask all of my guests. I haven't told you what it is yet, so you, I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. But it is, uh, what does being a woman living well mean to you? A woman living well. Um... Oh gosh, I have so I feel like I have so many answers that are popping in my in my head. I, I think for me, a woman living well for me is that I want to go back to the Maya Angelou quote that somehow, some way, um I I'm I'm doing something for the better good for for women, uh, for mm. sisterhood. Um uh, that I'm leading by example, or that I'm, I'm, I'm doing well by women, you know, that I, I that I'm doing a good, a good job, <laughs> I suppose, um, trying to always elevate and empower and encourage other women, uh, mm. that, you know, that there's that phrase that, you know, what do you do once you've, you've climbed the ladder and you've gotten to the top of it? And you want you, they always say what you want to do is look back down and help everyone else up. Mm -hmm. So I would like to think that that's if a, that's what a woman living well is doing is she's reaching, she's reaching out and helping people helping. Pull, them up, yeah. pull them in. Yeah. Great answer. Great <laughs> answer. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Florence Ann. It's been a delight. And as I said, we could have kept chatting. I me think my too. voice, my I think my voice is just holding out. So I apologize to the listeners that perhaps I've got a bit of a scratchy, scratchy voice today, but it's been great. Um, I'd encourage everyone to check your book out and to, uh, you know, read it and to get some answers about, you know, finding our community and joy later in life and building that village that's just right for us now. So thanks so much for that. And it's been a pleasure to chat. Thank you, Sue. Such a pleasure too. I could have done it all day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I've really enjoyed chatting with Florence Ann Romano today about building our village. And she really brought up a few points that I hadn't thought about, such as the primary village and the secondary village, how, um, you know, there are six types of villages that we might fit into all the categories, depending on who we are with. Um, and I found that, you know, for me, the virtual world can be just as good as the uh, in person. I hope that you have enjoyed the episode today. And if you have, I'd love you to share it with a friend who I'm sure will benefit from it. Are you going to take some time to have a think about who your village is? Do you need to make some changes to your village? Do you need to find a new village? But, um, you know, check out Florence's, Florence Ann's book, Build Your Village, A Guide to Finding Joy and Community in Every Stage of Life, and that might help you. So take care, have a great week, and um, that's it for this episode. And until next time, remember to live well, enjoy life, and most of all, be a woman living life your way. Bye for now.